Some say the U.S. is actually entering a new period of renaissance around technology change right now, which will make it extremely important for companies to stay on top of this. So what steps should boards take to ensure that senior executives are paying attention, enough attention to this? Well, I, I certainly agree that uh, we're certainly seeing uh, a renaissance here in, in the United States. Um, you know, we, it seems like the technology is taking us all for a ride, and, and it's not only impacting developed countries, it's impacting developing and undeveloped countries as well. So it's really um, el helping to elevate many, many things so they can all be done better. I think what's interesting about digital innovation is that the pace of change is so rapid it, it, it's, it, it's putting so much of pressure on traditional business models. So that the half-life of business models is constantly compressing uh, over time. We're not just talking about, when we talk about digital, we're not just talking about embracing a few software apps and tools. We're not even talking about having a digital strategy. What we're really talking about is position, you know, Positioning the organization to act and think digitally. And that's, that's, that's what we're really talking about. So from a board perspective, I think one thing the board needs to do is look at its composition. And, you know, does it have the right expertise sitting around that table that can enable it to effectively oversee uh, digital, digital innovation? Uh, if not, is it make availing itself to objective advisors who can advise the board on some of the potential opportunities and, and issues that are relevant to the organization? Uh -huh. Other aspect uh, would be digital readiness. Where is the organization on the digital maturity continuum? Hmm. So is it a leader or is it a follower? Nothing wrong with being a follower. There are a lot of successful companies that can be followers. But to be a follower, you've got to be agile. You've got to be resilient. You've got to be an early mover. You can't, you know, just sit back. Um, so <clears throat> are you a digital leader or are you an agile follower? By contrast, are you a digital skeptic or are you a digital beginner? And so where is the organization on the digital maturity continuum? And more importantly, from a board and executive management standpoint, where it should it be? Another aspect would be innovation velocity. Uh, Jeff Bezos had a fascinating letter to Amazon shareholders in the 2016 annual report. He issued this last April of 2017 in which he talked about decision velocity. And here, here's the CEO of Amazon talking about this. I mean, I think, you know, it's kind of like the old commercial when somebody speaks, everybody should listen. And, and he's <laughs> talking about uh, decision velocity. And so how quickly is an organization taking digital concepts like speech recognition, machine learning, artificial intelligence, robotics, visualization techniques, the ever-expanding mm -hmm. power of mobile, taking these and other digital concepts and using them to reimagine uh, key operating processes and key functions such as finance, information technology, and procurement. So how quickly are we doing this? Are we quick, are we quick enough? Are we making decisions at the speed a business. Uh, that's, that's the bottom line. Um, a fourth factor is talent. Do we have the right talent to move us to where we want to be on the digital maturity continuum? And that's an, you know, it, it's great to think about how we're going to empower our existing organization to, you know, uh, think and act digitally. But uh, there could be a hybrid model that needs to be thought about of bringing digital talent into the organization that can come at this and look at this objectively. 
because we can't be, you know, there can't be any reticence. We got to move. We got to got to move at the speed of business. So we may need some infusion of talent to go along with the powerful institutional memory of the existing uh, workforce. And then finally, barriers. You know, you got to deal ruthlessly with barriers through a change management process. So that's a starter. I mean, you focus on these areas of, uh, of uh, composition, uh, readiness, information, you know, decision velocity, uh, talent, and barriers. And from the standpoint of the board, Jay, management had better get this right. The hyperscalability of digital business models and the lack of entry barriers are enabling new competitors uh, to enter the market and scale quickly uh, and, and, and redefine and reimagine the customer experience. So established incumbents are looking at, I mean, if one thing, you know, to be, you know, not see it coming, but, you know, the other thing to react on a, on a timely basis, uh, dealing with a company that's born digital. So it's talent not only in the leadership of the organization, but it sounds like talent on the board. And when you're, you're pointing a little bit earlier about uh, the self-assessment, you know, these board members need to get out and find out what's going on uh, with associated with the technology as well. I thought NACD took a great step uh, this year bringing board members to the, um, uh, the CES in uh, Las Vegas, taking them through some of the new technology and, uh, you know, exposing them to things that they normally wouldn't be exposed to. But board members can't rely on organizations like NACD to do it for them. They've got to get out and do it themselves. Right. The disruption is just so great. I know just recently my wife and I, you know, sold our home in less than 48 hours without using a real estate agent. And so, the, the, you know, talk about disruption. Somebody lost a very, very big commission on that one. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Jim, in December, uh, you published an article on the five key principles around effective risk management. And you discussed the importance of encouraging and reinforcing the desired behaviors, including risk behavior. And I want to focus on this because this is so important in the company that I uh, was with recently. And uh, the CEO really led the effort around changing behaviors in the company. Part of the solution involved having appropriate incentives that are aligned to the values, culture, and performance so that the wrong behaviors are not being rewarded. And what should the board's role be in this, and how can they identify where incentives and risk culture might be misaligned? You know, it's really tough. And um, when, you, when you think about, when you see reputation harm being done to a proud brand. You know, sometimes we read these stories and they're on the far right hand column or the front page of the Wall Street Journal or they're in Fortune and Forbes or what have you and we shake our heads and we ask what were they thinking. Um, we sometimes we ask ourselves questions. What did they know and when did they know it? And ultimately those questions are directed to the board, you know. You know, and it's sad, but it's true that often that it's not unusual for the root causes of reputation harm uh, to be uh, made aware, the board becomes aware of it when it's just too late. Yeah. Part of the reason is that some of these reputation damaging events, they're spawned by decisions that were made many years ago earlier. And, and the velocity is very slow in terms of, of, you know, the effects of those decisions. And, you know, I, you, you, you know, with your background at GM, I'm, I'm always fascinated by when Mary Barrows, you know, became CEO. And here, she's a lifer. And uh, she's been all, all over GM. Uh, and she got hit by the ignition switch thing. And I, I greatly admired how she dealt with that. 
It was not the traditional, let's get this thing over with, let's sweep this under the rug, let's circle the wagon. I, I, she set an example for corporate America to be open, transparent, we're going to find out the truth, we're going to get this done. And then I read in, in, in Fortune uh, just the other day, she told employees in a town hall that we're never going to forget this. Mm-hmm. It's something we are always going to remember, and it, it it brings up a couple of rules, you know, that, are, that I think are paramount here. That you know, the stakeholder rule and the sunlight rule. The stakeholder rule: when you make critical decisions, pretend that your stakeholders are in the room with you, so you can be proud of your decision-making process. The sunlight rule, don't ever make a decision that when the sunlight shines on it, when the consequences occur from it, that it's going to force you into damage control. And so, you know, that's implicit in what Ms. Barrows is really trying to bring to the, that culture. And I wish more CEOs would focus like that. And from a board perspective, I think it, it points to two things culture and focus and culture mm-hmm. uh you know people say gosh it's a soft thing uh how do we deal with it but you know at the end of the day um you know it deals a lot with internal pressures internal pressures that you know can drive and create manage unmanageable bias uh, uh flawed decisions um uh, responsible or illegal behavior, and and this these pressures, there's pressure in every organization. Let's face it, you know, it's not easy being a business. It's not easy running a business. But what we're talking about are are, are pressures that are spawned by unrealistic performance targets, uh, conflicting business objectives, disruptive change that alters fundamentals in the business model, or imbalances between uh, the compensation given for short-term performance and the long-term interest of stakeholders. So a board got to do something about this. It needs to focus on looking at things like, you know, if, if the CEO really want to know the truth? Mary Barrows wanted to know the truth. Whatever it was, and she was open arms about sharing whatever the truth was. She wanted it all transparent. Did you have a CEO that has that quality? Wants to know the unvarnished truth because you can't improve a process. You can't improve decision making unless the CEO is committed to knowing the truth. So is the board comfortable that the CEO wants the unvarnished truth? Uh, is tone at the top, which you often see talked about, that's great. But is the tone in the middle, the mood in the middle, aligned with that tone at the top? Because the tone in the middle sets the tone at the bottom, the buzz at the bottom. So the tone at the top, the tone in the middle need to be aligned to create an effective tone of the organization. Uh, you know, I mean, in turn, you know, it comes down to connecting the dots, looking for patterns. Mm-hmm. One of my colleagues uh, here at Protivity, he meets with boards, uh, met, he, he probably meets with more boards than anybody else in Protivity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and culture is a big deal with boards. And he's developed his own opinion that boards have to have an intellectual curiosity. You know, to probe deeper if they don't understand something. Probe deeper if it's, something doesn't make sense. And to expect the internal audit to do the same thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, and finally, engaging in and getting back to the CEOs uh, willing to accept the unvarnished truth, uh, getting back to the point of the CEO um, being willing to engage in, in having external uh, anonymous surveys that mm-hmm. will spill, everybody can spill their guts out because they're protected <laughs> through anonymity and confidentiality, and if your baby is ugly, <laughs> your employees will tell you, 
your baby ugly. Believe yes, me. They are confident that their uh, views are confidential and anonymous. And more importantly, the CEO has to look the organization in the eye and say, I want to know the truth. And we are committed as an executive team to make the necessary uh, improvements that you that that come out of this survey. So, you know, glass door, um, uh, engaging in the best places to work surveys, um, mm -hmm. you know, that tells an executive team a lot. That culture focuses another area. It's hard to get make sure that performance incentives are fully aligned. Uh, if you, but you know, how do you get focused on that? And you know, this the, uh, the job of the compensation committee, and yet you know, you still see issues. So there are a number of areas. So you can start focusing where uh, on business units that carry a disproportionate amount of the risk in the overall risk profile or. or business units that are more significantly profitable than other business units are business units that take unusual risk in relation to other business units, like unusual environmental health and safety risk, are business units that compensated people differently. For example, they compensate their people on the completion of a specific act, whereas the revenue and the risk associated with that completed act carry on into the future. So loan origination is an example of that. If you compensate people based on originating loans, what do they care about in terms of the quality of those loans, whether the underwriting standards are met, whether their collateral is worth anything, what do they care? They're getting compensated. Let everybody else worry about the rest of the problems. So those are that culture and focus has got to be the order of the day on this very, very challenging problem. Mm -hmm. You mentioned surveys as a technique to find out how, how ugly the baby is, using your words, and uh, kind of matching that or aligning that with the most uh, risky areas of the business to see, do you have a problem with people not being comfortable, you know, getting issues on the table? Do they feel like they can, uh, they've got the information to see around the corner and what's coming next? Um, you know, do they feel like they can um, address things and that they're getting the proper respect from their, their supervisor, for example? And you mentioned no, no, Jay, to that point, to that, that point, Jack Welch wrote a very interesting shareholder letter in the latter years of his tenure. And mm -hmm. one of the topics he wrote, he talked about there's two ways that you get fired at G. <laughs> And one way is, you know, we rank and yank and all that stuff like everybody else. But the other way, we, he said, we are very demanding of our people. But you get fired here if you commit an ethical violation. Hmm. And so, yeah, we're demanding, but we expect people to operate and function within ethical bounds um, and by implication legal bounds. And so mm -hmm. that's, that's, that, that balance is something that executives and boards need to be concerned with. So I agree with you. Mm -hmm. And to your point earlier about alignment with the, the compensation and other kinds of incentives, uh, the company I came from, I was asked by our board and our senior leaders to take a look at the executive compensation plan and identify for the board whether we thought that uh, from our strategic risk management perspective, if we thought there were things in there that would uh, drive the wrong behaviors. So the company's very, very interested in doing that kind of thing. 